right? Uh, so Bruno has introduced me. I'm, I'm historian, a historian, a trained economic historian. Uh, my uh, field of studies, my primary field of studies is Latin American studies forever. I've always done uh, that from a comparative perspective. So from uh, five years now, uh, I've started doing also comparative uh, studies between Brazil, India and South Africa. And that's the reason why I've been to India a few times in recent years. And most recently, in the beginning of this year, as Bruno said, I've been there for two months as a visiting researcher. I should go back there uh, next year. So this is just to say that I'm not, um, uh, I'm, let's say, I'm, I'm a newcomer to Indian subject, to, to Indian studies. However, I think I can, uh, I, I, I can bring uh, enough um, a material for a, a meaningful discussion on, on India, on Indian economy and Indian politics. Uh, so what I intend to discuss with you is more uh, like the, the political economy of independent India. And we think that uh, a very important recent trend, which can be conceptualized as an hegemony shift, and a Germany from Congress Party politics, which dominated Indian politics since independence in 1947. So I don't know if you realize, but Indian, Indian politics have been a little bit like South African politics. They have been dominated by, the, by, by, by a single party, although there is a democratic election uh, system. So Indian politics have been dominated by the Indian National Congress Party since independence in 47, and that domination is less than until, uh, until the 90s, or actually until this century. Um, so there's been this shift from Indian, from Congress Party domination to uh, Hindutva domination. Hindutva meaning um, Hindu nationalist. Hindu nationalist as opposed to Indian nationalist. Hindu nationalist in the sense that it is a religiously uh, blended uh, nationalist. So this is so this is a very important uh, shift in Indian politics, which is the, will be in the background of my uh, of my exposition. So uh, I will I, I plan to unfold my presentation in four movements. I start I will start with some general remarks on India, understanding that many of you have very little background on on, on, on India. Uh, politics or, or India as such. Then I will move to discussing this uh, the, the political economy of Congress Party politics, which, as I told you, dominated India since independence. And then I will discuss the trend, the shift towards neoliberalism, which was in the 90s. And in the last part, I will discuss this hegemonic shift that I've been uh, talking to you since, uh, which has been. Um, uh, clearly affirmed since 2014 when the BGP, um, which is the, the, the Hindutva, the National uh, uh, Hinduist Party, has won uh, the elections and then they have just won elections again uh, this year. So this is uh, the movement of uh, I intend to, to do. So I'll start my remarks with a cliche. India is a world on its own, of its own. So this is like a time. Yeah? This is indeed a cliche, but a cliche that has to be taken seriously because it has analytical consequences. So I say that India is a world of its own in two senses, seen from within or seen or perceived from without. From within, because there is a variety of Indias that have been stitched together under the flag of India. And I'll come back to that later. But also when it's perceived from the outside, because India belongs to different cultural universe from the standpoint of what we could call as, as, as the West. So the sense of that India is a world of its own does not imply isolation, but difference. So from a Western perspective, India belongs to the realm of the other. So that if, if a Brazilian goes, for example, to Europe, he will see that the difference. He will not mistake Lima for Frankfurt, for example. If he goes to the Middle East, he, he, he's going to perceive that this is further different. But then if you go to India, then you have the sense that it's, 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 it belongs to different, um, a different cultural, civilizatory references, if you, if you want to say. 
And this has obviously historical roots. So to give you a sense of that, I will, I will start commenting that India historically, and, I, and, and, and then I'm talking about century-old history, has always been connected to, to parts of the world, interchanging with parts of the world which do not belong to what we could call as, as, as the West. So four different uh, areas uh, well, I would highlight. First, Polynesia, then China or Southeast Asia, then Eastern Africa, and then Central Asia. So India has always been connected towards this, this, this four, uh, to this, uh, four uh, directions. So that if you go, for example, to this one, oh, okay. So if you go to China, which is ju just been talking for this, is like this classic piece of literature which comes from the 16th century, a journey to the West. And then when you read it, the West that it refers to is actually India. So this is their West. So the West always depends on the point of view. Then if you go to Indonesia, Indonesia, and you go to Bali, which is the most uh, touristy place in, 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 in Indonesia, and then you're going to see that most of their historic attractions do share a, a, a Hindu background, because there's been a lot of interchange, and Bali is an island which is it's dominated by Hindus, their yeah, well, Hindu culture background. So, um, in another or even if you go to Angkor Wat, which is in, in, in Cambodia, which is the, the prime, it's like Machu Picchu in Peru, it's like a, 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 a major archaeological site. This is also Hindu, of uh, Hindu heritage, Hindu background from the 12th, 13th century. Uh, when we think about Eastern Africa, I think the most uh, conspicuous example is, is, is the trajectory of, um, of Gandhi, which I, I'm, I'm sure most of you are familiar with me. I, 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 I suppose you're aware that Gandhi, which was the, the principal leader of India's independence, he began his, his trajectory as a political leader in South Africa, where he traveled to to defend indentured laborers, Indian indentured laborers that were working there. He was not defending black specifically, he was defending Indian migrants to South Africa. So this is just one quick um, short example to illustrate that. And then you can think of, on, on the interchange with Central Asia, and, and, and you, can, you may think that lots of things that have, have reached the West or Europe, and from Europe, then, or for example, Latin America, they have come through Central Asia, or basically through the Arabs. So to give you an example, what we call in, in Latin languages the Arabic numbers, the Arabic, Arabic numbers are actually, uh, they have a, an Indian root, so that it was needed that the zero was first a conceived. And if you think this is, this is a trivial issue, I, I would suggest you next time you're bored with like a microeconomic uh, class, just to try to make a complex uh, like multiplications and divisions without the zero. Like what it was like to do complex uh, multiplication operations with Roman numerals. Yeah? But they came through uh, Arabic, uh, the, the, the Arab world, which was in between, yes, the West and India, so we call them Arabic numbers. So one important consequence of framing India as a world of its own is that the colonial experience was very different in India from, say, Latin America. Obviously, this is not to say that they were impervious to colonialism, as cricket will remind you, but it does mean that the colonial legacy was processed in a very peculiar, in peculiar ways, as Bollywood shows as well, uh, which is Bollywood, which is at once colonial or global, if you wish, because it reproduces the, the same artistic language that, that emanates that comes from Hollywood, but it's very peculiarly Indian. Nobody will mistake that as, as, as a Hollywood movie. Yeah. However, we should also be careful not to make a fetish out of the Indian culture framing it as timeless essentials. So, in one hand, we should be careful not to make, um, not to fetish in the culture, but on the other hand, not to uh, underestimate the importance of this, of this uh, cultural richness. Just to give you a, a quick example, last time when I came back to India at the beginning of this year, and I was coming back from the airport of, of Sao Paulo, there was a huge billboard saying, welcome, Paul. And the poem that the billboard was referring to was Paul McCartney was about to make a, a concert in Sao Paulo. And first thing that crossed my mind is such a billboard would be unconceivable in India. 
India is a place where the people still have uh, uh, connection to action. They went there, they spent time in an ashram in the small city of Rishikesh, and George Harrison tried to learn how to play the sitar. He said it took, it took him seven months just to learn how to sit with the instrument on his lap. So it's a, so, so it's a very different relation. So I, I don't know if I, I, I make it clear. What I, what I mean to say is that it's not, I'm not saying that the Beatles are not there, but the kind of relationship is very different when you look from a uh, Latin American perspective or from an Indian perspective. So the second way in which India is a world of its own is because the territory. Uh, this, is, this was in Curitiba. Here in Sao Paulo, it's just welcome home. Not enough, so we, you should uh, know which boat they were referring to. So the second way in which India is a world of its own is because the territory that bounds present-day India is home to an impressive cultural, linguistic, and religious variety. So that the you know, the first you know, that I that I that I've seen had its denomination printed in, in 13 different languages, but not only 13 different languages, but 13 different alphabets. And you should be aware that northern languages, the languages that dominate the northern part of India, they belong to the same uh, family between themselves, which is called the Indo-European family, which is opposed to the language, as opposed to languages in the south, which are mostly Dravidian families, so that there is very little connection between them, so that from somebody who has a, a Hindu background to learn Tamil from the south would be a little bit like somebody who speaks French and wants to learn Arabic. Like they're totally different uh, world. However, it's interesting to point out that the languages on the north, in the north of India, they are pretty much related to those, the Latin European languages. Because Latin is close to, is, belongs to the same family language of Sanskrit. So Sanskrit, which is in, at the root, of many North, northern Indian languages is, is, is related, related to Latin, which is uh, the, the, from which many uh, European languages stem from. So for instance, just to give a short example, if you think of numerals in the Hindi, so 7, 8, 9, and 10 are sat, at, no, does. So you can see that they're they, they, they actually they resemble very much what in the numbers are in Portuguese as well. So, um, so that's why they began to they, they belong to the same Indo-European language, and that's why actually English made a venue on, on becoming a, a sort of a lingua franca in India because it, it, it's, it's, it's very often been among the educated people because it's often easier to connect, to connect in, in, uh, to everybody to learn English then from an only one to learn Tamil and so on. So to some extent the diverse territory was brought this, this diverse territory was brought together by British rule which began in the 18th century. Railways stitched India together. They, they moved goods integrating uh, what, what was a wide market, but they also moved troops to ensure order and unity. So what I'm, I'm trying to suggest very quickly is that there was uh, the, 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 the construction, the construction of India as a, as, as, as a nation was nothing obvious. Okay. It, to, to a large extent, this variety of regions, cultures, religions were stitched together under British dominance. This is a complex issue, but just to give you uh, a sense of it. By the way, I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Benedict Anderson. He has this book called Imagine Communities. So when he, at a point he discusses, he contrasts the, what, what was the 19th century in Latin America and in India. And he points out that in Latin America, there was the independence process resulted in a variety of, of, of republics, like dozens of different countries, as opposed to India, where uh, the way like the, the, the Capitalism, monopolist capitalism in, in, in the second half of the, of the 19th century encountered or interacted with India, it, it, it produced the, the, the opposite result in the sense that India was, was stitched and brought and kept together as, as, as a cohesive uh, market, for example. So, and he, and, and, and Bennett, Bennett Anderson thinks, he says, his, his hypothesis is that. The contrast between Latin America, which broke out in, in, in dozens of different countries, and India, which was stitched to 
together. So it has to do with uh, the, the, the economic development of their respective metropolis, namely Britain in one hand, which was obviously a leading industrial revolution, and Spain on the other was just uh, on, on decay. So, so this was, so England, uh, they had both the means and the intention to, to build, uh, to stitch together a broad territory as an integrated market, thus constructing what they refer to as the most precious jewel in the crown. So India was, look out at the, the, the times of the British Empire, always considered to be the most precious jewel in the British crown. Uh, so that the opium war and, for example, the construction of the Suez Channel in Egypt, both in the, in the 19th century, they had to be explained against the background of British interest in India to be properly assessed. So like, the key issue around the Suez Channel was connection within in the direction to, of, of India. And the key issue behind the opium wars was that India had uh, to, to balance the trade uh, relation between India and Britain, and in order to do so, they had to, to have a surplus in another ice which would then be opium. So India would export opium to China. So, so just to give you uh, a quick notion of the centrality that India had uh, throughout uh, the times of the British Empire. Diversity is uh, linguistic, is geographic, and it's also religious. You should bear in mind that present-day India is home of Hinduism, which had Buddhism as its offspring. Just like uh, Christianism was a reform from Judaism, Buddhism sprang from Hinduism, and both had, uh, uh, had as, 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 as its home territory present-day India, or to some extent Nepal. This might sound like a cultural curiosity, but it's not. It does have um, it does have an important, uh, it plays a major ideological role, role today because Hindu nationalism, the Hindu that is, that is, that is sustained by the BGP party, which is in, in, in power, asserts itself on the grounds that all the religions, namely Muslims, are foreign. So there is the, the, the current ideology of the dominant party in Indian politics is, 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 is uh, rests on some sort of identification between India and Hinduism. And one of the consequences of that, so what, 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 what has spread from this territory that now today is India, is considered to be, let's say, genuine, genuinely Indian, and what comes from the outside is considered to be foreign. So that's, 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 that's the, the ideology that is behind the cleavages and the uh, the conflicts with Muslim population, which is about 17-18% of India's population, making India among the two or the three uh, uh, countries with the largest Muslim population in the world. Obviously, this is a very problematic uh, way uh, of reason, which leaves outside uh, that it doesn't consider that Islam has been in India for much longer than Catholicism has been in the Americas, for example. Yeah? And it doesn't consider that uh, most monuments which India is famous for, actually, they have, they were built under Muslim room, such as the Taj Mahal or the Red Fort in, in, in Delhi, and so on. So last point I want to make is that this cultural, linguistic, geographical diverse, diversity has led to a peculiar regionalization of Indian politics, in the sense that few of the political parties can be considered to be national in range. This is a peculiarity of, of Indian politics. Perhaps the only two parties that have actually uh, reached a um, um, national uh, range have been the Congress Party, the Council of Independence, and the current BGP party. So in fact, we should remember that at a, 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 a ideological level, the independence movement that was led by Gandhi in the interwar years was driven by the need to submerge these differences, these linguistic, ethnic, religious, but also caste differences, submerge all of them 
into, into to an Indian nationalism that was on the making. Indian nationalism as, as a political construct. And that was certainly one of the major achievements of this the Indian national movement that had the Congress National, the Indian National Congress as its leading organization. So that as independence unfolded on the aftermath of the Second World War, such Indian nationalism, again, as opposed to Hindu nationalism, uh, or opposed to Muslim nationalism, was this, uh, the, the Indian nationalism was powerless to preserve territorial unity in India. So I think you you were aware that uh, when India was independent, together with independence came up partition, so that a part of this of, of what was then India became Pakistan. At that time, Eastern and Western Pakistan, which then in the 70s, East Pakistan became Bangladesh. So it was it was unable to preserve the territorial unity. But on the other hand, the Indian nationalists did assert itself as the fundamental political reference of this of the new country. So as I, as I already told you, Indian nationalists, as as, as embodied by Nehru, Jawaharlal Nehru was was the, the foremost leader, the political leader of the Congress Party and Prime Minister between 47 to 64 of India is the man behind, for example, the Bandung Conference, which brought together, which ended up on the non-alignment uh, movement. So they, 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 they did assert as, like, as, as, as a dominant reference for Indian politics, which lasted, as I mentioned before, until the 90s. So this identification between what became uh, the Congress Party and independent India meant that the party dominated politics until recently pretty much like the South African National Congress, as I already mentioned. Even, uh, even left-wing parties, as, as, as the, the Communist parties, were unable to assert themselves on a national level, even if they have uh, dominated some st state police politics for, for long, for example, in Kerala, which is in the south, or West Bengal, which borders uh, Bangladesh, the communists, uh, they've been communist rule for, for a long time, but that's on a state level on a provincial level, but not in the nationwide. So that the BGP, as I said, was the first national alternative to emerge to the Congress Party dominance. So this gives me, this background gives me a starting point to discuss the political economy of independent India. So I cannot discuss the complexities of the fascinating struggle for independence for India. For that, I would refer to this. This is a very accessible book, which is uh, I found an excellent uh, introduction to, to that matter. Uh, but I do want to uh, highlight uh, some, some aspects of it. First, uh, oh, one aspect of it. I want to stress that the, the anti-colonial movement that was led by Gandhi and the leadership of the, the National Congress tried to build a comprehensive front under the banner of, of Indian nations. So as I told you, they tried to build a front, so bring everybody together. So on, the, on that process, they were supported by a native bourgeoisie that was constituted in the gaps of English rule and whose interests generally evolved in opposition to British rule. So this native bourgeoisie support to the national movement had a dual effect, because on one hand, this bourgeoisie strengthened the anti-colonial movement because they supported the Congress, so the movement, the movement became uh, stronger because of that. But on the other hand, this native bourgeoisie, or this native, let's say, dominant class, uh, sorry, capitalist class, also led its imprint on the political aspirations, on the political orientation and program of the, of the, the Congress party once independence uh, came through. In other hand, in, in, uh, in another way, another way of saying it is that they play a moderating role not only against socialist influence, but also against anti-caste trends inside Congress politics. What I, what I, so what I, what I want to say is that this, the support of this uh, native bourgeoisie, on one hand, strengthened the movement, but on the other hand, it had consequences as far as the, the, the political agenda of the of the Congress movement itself and the political agenda that imposed itself on independent India after 1947. So to give you an example, 
it should be reminded uh, that, that, that Gandhi was always, he's, he's very known for, for his, let's say, uh, uh, politics against uh, caste. And you know, I'm, I'm not going into the caste issue because it's too complicated. And uh, Anyway, uh, however, it should be, not many people are aware of the fact that Gandhi was always against caste discrimination, not caste itself. In a way that the, the remarkable political leader called Ambedkar, who was the, the, the leader, the, the one that the drafted the, the first constitution of India, who was actually a talent, which means to say an outcast himself, his background, he was able to outlaw caste discrimination in the constitution, but not caste hierarchy itself. So I don't know if I make myself clear, so caste discrimination has been outlawed, but not the hierarchy of caste remains in either to this to, to this day. So and this was, by the way, was the backdrop of his many uh, uh, misunderstandings with, with Gandhi, between Ambedkar and Gandhi. So this middle path that prevailed on politics, of which I'm giving you this example regarding the concerning the caste issue, has also prevailed on the economies. So while independent in India, neither uh, so this is, um, well, Nehru and the movement, this is the constitution, and this is Ambedkar. Ambedkar, by the way, he, he converted to Buddhism by the end of his life because he came to the conclusion that it was impossible to do anti-caste politics in India without going against Hinduism itself. And so they, he led a massive conversion to Buddhism in the early 50s. So, so again, this is the, the, the time frame that we're dealing from now on. So, while independent India neither subverted private property nor revolutionized the relations of production, India was the country that advanced most in the direction of a non-colonial economic development within the framework of capitalism in the third world. So, this is a very important idea. Well, this is not readable, but I'll, I'll repeat that. India was the country that advanced most in the direction of a non-colonial economic development within the framework of capitalism in the third world. So, what, are, what are, so there were there were countries where. So, how does this uh, concretize itself? The development of a national industry and a planned economy are the, the, the most uh, uh, visible aspects of it. So, what are, what are, what are, mean to say is that there were, there were countries in the third world where planning economy was taken further, but not among the, 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 in the, the capitalist third world. So let's say China, so the, the economic planning was, was taken to another level, but that was, but then they, had, uh, they were going against capitalism. So the development of a, of a national industry and of a planned economy the commitment, the commitment to secular states and secular politics and the defense of non-alignment throughout the Cold War, these were the hallmarks, these were the pillars of the political horizon that was affirmed in India under the leadership of Jawaharlal Nehru, which came over 1947 to 64, and which prevailed until the 90s. So on the other hand of this, 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 this political arrangement, there was a political arrangement where landlords and other conservative sectors supported Congress politics and that has blocked, for example, agrarian reform and limited the structural changes as a whole. One example was the caste policy that I mentioned. So, in general, if you take it like upon on a, on a, an overview, the Nehruvian landscape predicted that development and modernization would solve problems such as poverty or inequality. This same approach actually prevailed on dealing with the division of caste and communities. Communalism is, is the politics uh, instrumentalized by religion. So they were perceived as remnants of a so-called feudal past that was to be overcome through progress. So the idea, the general idea is that the caste, uh, the determination of caste into Indian society would be overcome through development, to modernization on itself. It's a, a little bit to make a comparison. It's like the, 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 the Cuban, Cuban Revolution approach, for example, to racism, racism or to gender issues. If, 
it, this, this comes from, from uh, uh, if, we, if we develop the country, this, uh, which are subjective remnants of, 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 of past society, will just evaporate. Then we see it wasn't exactly the case. So how did the Indian economy evolve under this uh, Nehruvian landscape? At first it fared relatively well. However, from the 60s on, India, like Brazil and other countries, faced the limits of national development and industrialization and substitution of imports. However, India responded quite differently compared to Brazil. In the 70s, state control of the economy So, uh, state control of the economy intensified. So, this is very different from the Brazilian case. The country's major banks were nationalized in 69, as was the insurance industry in 71, the coal industry, and restrictions on foreign investment were intensified. As a consequence, the share of foreign capital in the Indian economy in the early 80s was relatively small, accounting for about 10% of the value added in the manufacturing and mining sectors. 10%. As a consequence, uh, uh, foreign participation in, in, in the financial sector was also marginal. So in this context, uh, India did not experience recession, hyperinflation, nor a debt crisis analogous to Brazil or other Latin American countries in the 80s. Uh, on the contrary, in the 80s, it, 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 it registered an industrial growth rate of around 8% distancing itself from the so-called infamous Hindu rate of growth of around 3% that had prevailed in the 70s. So India actually had a, had a fast-growing uh, 80s. So again, very different from Latin American situation where it was hyperinflation, um, debt crisis, recession, and, and the like. However, the main driver of this uh, expansion was public spending, which caused increasing fiscal deficits which were then covered with international loans, which were uh, renegotiated on increasingly onerous conditions. So in a decade, the surplus of 1.5 billion, which was registered in the balance of payments in 77-78, which was about 1.4 of GDP, turned into a deficit of almost 10 trillion, 9.9 .9 billion in 1991, which was about 3.5% of GDP despite a favorable evolution of the, trade, of the trade balance in the second half of the 80s. So, so the country's financial expenses increased at, at an exponential rate, so that by the end of the decade, of the decade interest expenditures consumed about one-third of the state's revenue, the state project. In 1988, India was this, uh, Asia's largest debtor. So that by different, through different paths, Brazil and India found themselves in a vulnerable financial position in the early 90s. Facing fiscal and trade deficits at a time of international liquidity <coughs> shortages to find refinance the debt, the Indian state faced the balance of payment crisis in 1991. So in 1991, the Indian state was in the brink of moratorium. That was the context where the India state embraced neoliberalism, which was personified on the so-called new economic policy implemented in 1991. So why was there such a shift on the national bourgeoisie? There are many uh, uh, reasons. So I, I will highlight some that C.P. Chandra Shaka, which is uh, known uh, Indian economist, highlights. He says, you know, and big, big Indian business perceived on the international association as a way to overcome the limits of the internal market. As I told you, the, the country had been marked by low rates of growth on the seventh so I put that was not a problem in the eighties anymore. Other players perceived the international partners as a lever to dispute the internal market itself against traditional groups which were perceived to have to benefit from state protection. Many were tempted by privatizations, so the privatization of, of state assets were seen as a, as, a, as a big opportunity for doing business, while agribusiness intended to exports while not giving away to subsidies. So lastly, there was an aspiration for the modernization of consumption pattern among the middle class, and this has favored liberalization, commercial liberalization, 
This trend was amplified under the influence of the Indian diaspora. I don't know if you're aware of that, but India has the largest population outside its home country. So I remember for the first time I've been to India was in the early 90s, and it was very clear that the context. Uh, when you, if, if you, if you, I remember when I went with my, my family to Chile, I have a brother that lives there, so I took my own daughters, and they would see McDonald's, and they would say, whoa, daddy, they have these Brazilian sandwiches here in, in Chile as well. So, so you have, you know, like this, this what, I don't, there was nothing such in, in, in India, in the early 90s. I remember reading actually a business magazine where they were talking about Kellogg's. Kellogg's, which would do cereal, sucrilhos in Portuguese. And so they, they, they wanted to, to launch cereal into the, the Indian market. And the, the merchandise that they were doing for cereal was talking how un, unhealthy were the food habits of, of, of Indians in general, like because they would eat like lot, lots of fried food on breakfast and so and, and so on. And then the, the, the article that I read was saying that there, that was a wholly unsuccessful marketing strategy and that Kellogg's was withdrawing from the country. So there were other so in the beginning of the 90s, the point that I want to make again is not that it, it, India was not Alba, Albania, was not an isolated country, not, not North Korea, but compared to the levels of open and of colonial, and I'm talking about cultural colonization, for example, that are familiar, for example, for, for Latin American uh, countries, perhaps Africa, the reality should be closer to that. It was a very different landscape than in the mind. So, so, despite the ambivalence of Indian capitalists in the face of globalization, India entered a structural adjustment program aiming at reducing the balance of payment deficit and stabilizing the economy. In the process, the rupee, which is the Indian currency, was devalued and capital control was progressively liberalized as were imports. Public spending has been reduced, subsidies cut, and privatizations carried out. In 2000, the Indian version of the Fiscal Responsibility Act entered Parliament agenda and was passed on three years later. So, although the debt of the structural adjustment, the structural reforms in India was less extreme compared to similar programs in Latin America or elsewhere, for example, in Eastern Europe, neoliberal orientation has prevailed in leading the state ever since, despite political automation. So, evidence of the country's opening between 19 and 2007, the international exchange rate of goods and services in the Indian economy doubled from 17 to 31%. So in the early 90s, it was 17% rate of, 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 of international exchange of, of, of goods and, and services. Then it became 31%. In 2014, it was uh, at 54%, and it's now over 60%. So the openness, uh, the real openness of the Indian economy has been increasing, although it, it still does not compare to other um, uh, economies. So in 2004, which was the year that Congress Party, so this all happened under Congress Party rule. Yeah? Then Congress Party lost elections in 1980s. Then they, they come back in 2004. So when they came back in 2004, the public sector still commanded 75% of, of banking assets. So finance was still commanded by the public sector. So, uh, However, these reforms were enough to subject public finances to the dynamics of international speculative capital. So as in Brazil, liberalization resulted in sharp trade deficits, and the expectation that these trade deficits would be provisional in the Indian case were not fulfilled. In the initial years of the opening, this whole, the whole of the debt, trade deficit, was, uh, was filled by remittance from these non-resident Indians who surpassed all forms of capital inflow combined in the early 90s. However, between 2001 and 2011, the trade deficit jumped from 6 billion to 185 billion. That is, it jumped 30 times, the trade deficit. So beyond remittance of its expatriates, India depends on, on a, a attracting foreign investment to offset this growing trade deficits. As in Brazil, the conjunction between the liberal macroeconomic Discipline and high interest rates attracts, above all, speculative capital. Greenfield investments are small, and the expectation of boosting industrial exports has been largely frustrated to this point. 
Only pharmaceutical and service sectors have shown international competitiveness, and the participation of multinational in exports is less than 10% as compared with, 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 with China, which is above 50%. So most foreign direct investment goes to acquisitions and mergers geared to the Indian domestic market. So if industry participation remains stagnant, the service economy has grown, has grown significantly since liberalization. Between 1997 and 2008, the IT sector, <coughs> technology services, went from 1.2% of GDP to 7.8%, of which 80% is for export. However, it sh you should bear in mind that this is an industry that is segmented between, we could segment it into two different holes. In one hand, there is a, uh, a skilled but low employment sector. On the other hand, there is a, a broad range of outsourced services that require English-speaking labor force at low cost, such as the notorious um, call service industry. So in 2013, for 14, it is estimated that the later, that means the, 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 service, the low cost service industry, accounted for 90% of, of IT related services exports, while the development of software products accounted for only 6%. Therefore, the success of these exports, of the exports of services in India, are directly linked to the outsourcing trend of large multinationals, are aiming to cut costs. In this context, there are many in India, in India that compare this export of services performed by what they call cyber coolies, like the coolies were those that perform um, low paid um, uh, jobs historically in, in, in India. So, this, the export of services performed by cyber coolies to the emigration of unskilled sectors. They basically, they are, it's, it's, it's the same trend. However, some of them stay in Western India while others go abroad. Growing on an average of, of, of over 9% annually since the beginning of the century, uh, India's current contribution to the global exports of services is, is estimated at 3.35%, which is double its participation on the, exportion, on the exportation of goods. However, despite constituting itself as an urban economic sector based on the exploitation of cheap labor, there is a gap between the weight of the service industry in the Indian economy, which is over 50% of the economy, and the generation of labor that corresponds to it. The sector employs less than 30% of the workers, two-thirds of them in small enterprises in the informal economy. So despite the expansion of international business since, in, since the structural reforms, only 6% of the country's workforce is in the corporate sector and almost 90% remain outside the so-called, what they call the organized sector of the economy. In other words, 90% have an informal status. The slow pace of job creation in what will soon be the most populous country in the world is a serious problem for which the expansion of the service sector offers no solution. Furthermore, about two-thirds of the Indian population still lives in the countryside and half of the workforce is engaged in rural activities. Since independence, food security has been an inescapable social and political concern, which inhibits to some extent the expansion of agribusiness for export. So although agricultural goods account for 10% of exports, Indian economy does not revolve, it's not driven by agricultural or commodity exports, such as the Brazilian economy, for example. The situation of India's rural population, however, worsened with neoliberalism as various food security and social assistance policies were cut out, or reduced or cut. The combination of liberalization of imports, cuts in subsidies, cuts in rural assistance programs, and reduction of state services and jobs in the countryside has condemned those who live of the land to despairing conditions. An extreme expression of this reality is the high rate of suicides reported. Since 1995, a study from Berkeley University records that over 12,000 Indians in the rural area have killed themselves. So if, if, if the overall count is, is over 300,000 rural workers between 1995 and 2008. So the social impacts of neoliberal reforms, so what were the consequences of this? No, 
know, along the political sphere. The social impacts of the neoliberal reforms accelerated the end of the Congress Party domination in, in, in Indian politics. However, the degradation of Congress politics facilitated polarization towards communalism. Communalism understood as a politicization of religion, often embedded in violent rhetoric and practices. The roots of communalism, by the way, trace back to British colonial domination, which fostered religious cleavages as a way to as, as, as a as a way to weaken the Indian National Congress politics, which, as I as, as I told to you, preached secular nationalism and tried to subordinate all religious, social, regional differences to under the flag of an Indian or Hindu nationalism. So. So the, the, the British have, a, have a, an important uh, had an important role in making communalism, that is religious uh, politics, uh, a, a central element in, in into Indian politics. However, obviously, this rebirth of communal politics is uh, has to do with other uh, dynamics. Communalism on a whole, on a, on a whole rests on the premise that co-religions, that, that is to say people that share the same religion, share the same secular interests, and that these interests are incompatible or even antagonist to those of other religions. It is an, an ideology based on fear and hatred, which in recent years has established synergetic relations with the US rhetoric of the war on terror. So over the years, communism was always there. However, it was in the 90s, from the 90s on, that it, that it rose to a dominant place in Indian, um, in Indian politics. Because many perceive, uh, there's, there's not necessarily a connection between here and what I'm saying, because I lost track of the, <laughs> the most important. But these are basically some of the consequences of liberalism and the, and the Congress rule. So, so I would say that uh, communal politics was always there, but they, they, they raised to, to a, a different uh, political importance in the 90s. By the way, they were, they were at, at, at points they were, they were <coughs> forbidden by communist parties, but this is, a, this is another issue. Uh, so, and why was that? So many perceived, this is so, there's, there's a corresponding trend between the demise of the Congress party and the ascent of Hindutva, of Hindu nationalism. And one basic connection between both phenomena was that secularism was identified, was perceived as one aspect of what was perceived as the failure, the failure of Congress Party politics historically. So with the coming to power in, uh, in 1998 of the Bharatiya Janaka Party, which is the BGP, Communal politics was raised to a high pitch. At the same time, the economic dimension of the political debate uh, moved to the background. Since 1991, the rationality of structural adjustment gave the tone of reforms that were uh, advanced by either party. Since then, so since, since the rise of BGP, the central cleavage in Indian politics is not economics, but it's social and cultural issues. Uh, while macroeconomic parameters are basically uh, are scarcely questioned. So, when the Congress Party returned to power in the uh, okay, this is not readable, so I'll just keep it. So, when the Congress Party came back, so as I told you, so Congress basically dominated in politics since yeah, since independence. There were some ups and downs in the late 70s, then in the 80s, but there were short, short span. In 1998, for the first time, uh, Hindu, the, uh, Hindu politics, Hindu nationalist politics were, were elected to a full term, as, uh, of, so which lasts se seven years. Then, in 2004, Congress was back uh, on, on the government. And when they were government, they, they tried to to, to partial, partially repair the situation they had corroborated to create. They were elected with support of the left, which is basically the communist parties at that time, which they united against what was perceived as the rise of this Nudva politics, which was, uh, well, was 
perceived as, as, as something serious that should be uh, faced against. So the, their campaign at that time proposed a reform of the human face with the protection of reconciling economic reforms whose uh, foundations were not uh, threatened with social reforms. So, along, so during this mandate uh, from 2004 on, the Congress uh, implemented uh, a variety of social measures, which I would like to show you, but I think it's not, it's not really, yeah. Uh, so basically, it's the like, National Rural Employment Guarantee Act, which offered elemental protection against unemployment for rural workers. Uh, a, a variety of, of, of programs, which are not going, uh, midday meal program, pension system for, for widows, for handicapped, and so forth. So it was another initiative. So similarly to what, what has happened in Brazil with, uh, with the Bolsa Familia uh, cash, conditional cash transfer programs, some have seen on that approach of the Congress Party a, a more universalist approach to in providing social assistance, while activists have criticized a slide towards targeted policies to combat poverty rather than the defense of, of people's um, uh, rights, workers' rights. Again, as was the case in Brazil, these policies were facilitated by high growth rates, averaging between 9% between 2004 and 2008 in the case. In this context, Congress was re-elected in 2009. However, economic growth also fostered unfolded into social conflicts. Massive flows of foreign capital, which in 2007 amounted to 9.2% of the GDP, intensified financial speculation, but also real estate. Real estate is a so if you, if, who wants to be a millionaire in that, that movie, which it, uh, is, it, it has, you know, different, it's like short stories within one larger story. So you can see there are two of them that show how this, the real estate thing, the real estate boom, even when it, you know, as there's a meeting point of, of the gangster, which is a, 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 a huge high uh, skyscraper, which is abandoned, it's building abandoned in, the, in, the, in Mumbai. So, uh, real estate has been a major uh, thing. So, I'm up, it, it, it's been one of the, the, the engines of the economic growth has been the construction, construction industry. And this expansion has affected the cities and the countryside, involving residential and commercial projects, infrastructure works, and the creation of special economic zones. In all cases, they have provoked conflicts. I'm not going uh, through them at this point. The Congress did not have direct support in the second term, but it did advance a relevant social program in the end of its term, which is called the Viral Food Debt. And this act has outraged the upper class and the middle class party. On the other hand, successive corruption scandals undermined the party's prestige among the middle class, while the limits to job creation, despite economic growth, eroded its popular constituency. So, although there are superficially there, there, there are similarities between the reasons for the erosion of Congress Party dominance and those that affect the PT, such as corruption scandals, for example, there are notable differences. One, there is nothing comparable to June 2013 uh, protests in Brazil. No, there is nothing comparable in India. But another interesting feature is that uh, when Congress Party lost elections in 2014, the economy was still growing which is different from the, 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 the Brazilian situation. 2015, 2016 was already recession was on the horizon. So the reasons for this defeat, the defeat of, of Congress, had to stem from the long political erosion, corrosion of Congress credibility, it, which is a process that dates back to the 70s, but which gained new contours when the party took over the structural adjustment agenda, contradicting its historical landscape. So now I'll come uh, a few words on Narendra Modi, which is the current, um, the current prime minister, which, as I said, was elected in 2014 and just been re-elected in, in early, earlier this year. So Narendra Modi's election as Indian prime minister in 2014 put Hindu nationalists back in charge as the Congress party faces the biggest legitimacy crisis in its history while the left was reduced to its lowest parliamentary representation since independence. Modi is an RSS board. The RSS is an organization 
of Edo nationalism that was created in the interwar years in the protests, which at that time was clearly inspired of fascism. Then it didn't become a, it was totally uh, shadowed by the growth of, the, of the, the International Congress. However, the RSS has always been there. It's a highly trained, highly organized, hierarchized and the organization which has branches in every uh, uh, aspect of, 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 of Indian society, from education to press to culture. A, a, a comparison to the Brazilian context, Obviously, you have to make that 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 patient is not the same, but it would be like the new Pentecostal, the, the evangelists, uh, uh, in, in the sense of their of their penetration in the down in, 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 in the fabric of the Indian society. So, Modi is a, an RSS guy, so which means he comes from this. Uh, this he has this this, this this background. He's reputed for his pro business attitude and brutal methods of politics as a governor of Gujarat. Gujarat is a state which, by the way, was Gandhi's um, home state. In Gujarat, Modi was accused of complicity with the massacre of thousands of Muslims in 2002. He's a politician rude but charismatic, with the uh, adept at the spectacularization of politics and social media activists, which turns Hindu motives, Hindu religious motives, into personal or business marketing, projecting a modernizing vision of Hindutva. On the other hand, as the, <laughs> that aggressive. On the economic front, the BGP intends to further open and deregulate the domestic markets in order to attract foreign investment, while supporting the expansion of internationally competitive Indian business. From the standpoint of big business, his centralizing and ruthless style is perceived as conducive to fast track in. So, and this is very important. And this is based on comparison, I would say, to what we are seeing in Brazil at this moment. His centralizing and ruthless style is perceived as conducive to fast track in, circumventing legal, environmental, and bureaucratic concerns. However, this task is tall. Since the early 2000s, India has been facing increasing trade deficits, as I've mentioned already, particularly with Asian countries and particularly with China, as the increase in imports has not been offset by, the, by exports of manufacturers or services. So despite the trend towards economic liberalization, analysis, point to, analysis from a liberal point of view points to various obstacles, obstacles to attracting transnational manufacturers. As such, the Indian market is still considered to be relatively closed, reserving many products for small local business. Labor legislation is considered stringent. Obviously, this is compared to China, not compared to Germany, making it difficult to lay off temporary contractors. The state bureaucracy is seen as a hindrance to foreign investment, while regulations hinder the acquisition of land for industrial purposes, which still have to confront uh, farmers and unions. Finally, infrastructure is precarious, and the Indian subcontinent, that means the areas surrounding India, including the countries that, 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 that border that are, uh, around India, is among the, the least integrated regions in the world. The interregional trade rate is the lowest in the world, accounting for less than 5% of trade. So faced with these setbacks, the size of the domestic market is seen as one of the, uh, as one of the only Indian strength in, in, the, in the Asian context. So adopting this Make in India slogan, adopting the Make in India slogan, Modi set out to increase the share of the industrial GDP from 16% to 25% in 2022. That was his stated goal. Creating 100 million new jobs. So it's almost yes. like giving jobs to a third of the Brazilian population. Under his presidency, the country's economy continued to grow at a rapid pace, becoming in 2017 the most dynamic G20 economy ahead of China, with a growth rate of over 7%. By 2018, the country's GDP surpassed the United Kingdom and France, making India the world's fifth largest economy. However, the trends that I've already described persist. Although the country was the ninth world destination for foreign direct investment in 2016, 
there were few greenfield investments and even fewer jobs. New sectors of the economy have been opened into national capital, including universities, hospitals, banks, and retail. On retail, for instance, Walmart is, is, is in India, operating 21, not with this, this, this brand, but they operated the so-called best price shops with the ironic slogan of make small Indian prosper. That's the Walmart store in India. And they've just announced that they plan to multiply their, their uh, <coughs> business in India in the coming years. So at the same time, so meanwhile, uh, the manufacturing sector was losing 19,000 jobs by the end of 2017 in a country that needs to create 1 million jobs a month to absorb the growth of its workforce. Just to absorb the growth of its workforce. At the same time, the government launched a project development fund to support Indian industries interested in manufacturing, in the manufacturing hubs in what is the so-called CMLV, CLMV countries, which is Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, and Vietnam. This policy, which contradicts the, the Make in India Modi uh, flag, is justified by the argument that the competitiveness of Indian industry will increase, bringing more advanced practices and technologies to the country in the long run. Africa has also attracted Indian business and even some industries. While Modi promises less bureaucracy and red carpet, uh, and red carpet for international business, his domestic policy is marked by obscurantism and repression. Despite its, its constitutional surface, the government operates in a state of permanent exception, manipulating aggressive Hindu nationalism amid authoritarian practices. The growth of a culture of impunity is denounced as NGOs, intellectuals, activists, and students are persecuted. For example, I remember in January 2018, at the very same day when uh, Modi was being um, highly cheered at the Davos Economic Forum in 2018, there was a huge um, demonstration of, of, of rural workers that had walked from the south towards the capital. And the principal, the main university of the country, was JN University, was in a permanent, in a, in a state of permanent upheaval. There is growing an easiness under a government that is compared. I'm not saying that I, that I agree with that. I'm just saying that many people there compare this government to fascism by intellectuals of different backgrounds. The social base of BGP includes includes big capital including those derived from the immunization of consumption, for example, such as the Ayurvedic products industry. Landowners, the middle class, which was reactive to the endemic corruption in the Congress party politics, the Indian diaspora, part of the lumpen proletariat between the youth without work and the untouchables. In the absence of a political project that goes beyond the art of winning an election, in which the BGP, by the way, became a master, BGP policy turns against the horizon historically associated with the Congress Party. The State Planning Commission has been suppressing, while the government does not produce uh, statistical data anymore. Statistical data has been despised as a leftist thing. So at the same time, it manipulates the poverty line in its favor, and some will argue that it manipulates as well the growing rates in its favor. Long-term lending structures have been depleted, and like other instruments of developmentalism, they became commercial. Even the social laws enacted in recent years, which I've just mentioned, under the Congress Party ruling in 2004, are, are, are currently under threat. From the point of view of foreign policy, the cleavage between the Congress Party and BGP seems secondary. Under either party, the North has been to negotiate the terms of the country's integration under globalization. Of course, there are differences as Hindu nationalists flirt with Jewish nationalism, both backed by, the, uh, by hostility to Muslims with the good pleasure of the White House. However, so if politics is not the same, the, the difference has a limit, which is the isolation of the economy, as I already mentioned. In general, the BGP differs from the Congress Party not because of the economy, but because of politics.
Ironically, the ideology of both parties refers to an economic uh, nationalism that, that in practice has been buried. If Congress itself dug the hole in the 90s, the PGP strives to throw the line sharp. <coughs> Although the to was economic ideology refers to Swadeshi, which could be translated as, as self-sufficiency, the ruling BGP is committed to settling the horizon associated with the Congress Party, which includes national industrialization, secularism, and non-alignment. So these are over, as well as a tepid remission to socialism. The polarization between congressional, pol congressional politics, Congress party politics, and the BGP is real, so I don't want to give you the impression that there is nothing at stake because the economic is not on, 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 the, on, on discussion anymore, or it is not at the forefront of discussion of the debate. The, the polarization is, 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 is real because communal politics kill people. However, this polarization also fulfills a conservative function as alternatives that face the structural dilemmas of Indian society are avoided. For as one proverb in India says, when two elephants fight, it is the grass that suffers. So just to finish this uh, presentation, I, I, I just want to, uh, you to have a look on, on the on numbers of recent election results to see uh, how the domination of the BGP has increased. So they don't, they don't depend on alliances anymore to govern, which would, would be a problem either, because they have the, the, the plenty of political forces that would be willing and have been part of their political base on the previous government. So to illustrate the trend that I, that I was talking to, the trend, the, the shift of hegemony, of Congress party hegemony, so you can see that the, 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 the dominance of BGP, it's, it's similar to what the Congress Party dominance has been in the past. <coughs> and so they have, and they have spread their dominance to other parts of northeast of the country, which is uh, or northwest of the country, which historically was a, a, a strong uh, where, where the Congress Party was particularly strong. So. So I'm not going to discuss that because I've not spoken about uh, uh, but then how do we interpret this, 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 this victory. Uh, uh, so I think it's, yes, we can go to, to discussion. You can just see they've been, uh, <laughs> they've been together recently. Okay, 